Hello. Good morning. For those of you here to hear, to, um, expecting to hear lots of funny stories from me, that's really, I'm going to talk about him as a, um, uh, Russell as a humorist, um, but I did bring one joke. Um, tenderfoot, how do you lead a wild stallion? Cowboy, it's simple. First you get a rope, then you tie it to the wild stallion. Tenderfoot, and then? Cowboy, and then you find out where the wild stallion wants to go. <laughs> so, good morning everyone. I'd like to thank Dr. King and Dr. Panther for including my presentation as part of the Charles M. Russell Symposium. Although my current research focuses primarily on American philanthropic history, I'm honored to be here today talking on the topic of Russell as a humorist. My remarks are very much work in progress, and I welcome comments, criticisms, and suggestions, because you all are the experts. It is lovely to be back here in Tulsa again. I was here for a technology symposium last year, which is when I was first introduced to Russell's works. With this presentation, I have come home. This paper is dedicated to my father, Alfred Justin Rurick, who was a petroleum geologist, and who had a wonderful sense of humor. I think I may have said last year, um, when I was in third grade, we were living in um, uh, just outside of Detroit, I was sick, and when I was sick, I got to sleep in my parents' bed. Stay home from school, sleep in my parents' bed. And my father came in at the end of the day, and he handed me my first Nancy Drew mystery. And as he handed it to me, he said, I used to drink, I used to read these when I was a little girl, and walked out of the room. <laughs> And so I spent the rest of the afternoon wondering when my father had been a little girl. <laughs> um, my father's parents were vaudeville performers. Uh, on the left you see my grandmother, Florence Marker, and my grandfather, um, age, uh, his name was actually Nathaniel Rarick, but the, the, uh, the um, group that he led was called A.J. Lay and their band So Gay. <laughs> Um, they were primarily comedians. Um, my grandfather was a black-faced comedian who went by the name of Snowball. Um, they were hoofers. You can see that they're hoofers there. Um, and they were singers, uh, uh, very good singers. My mother could not carry a tune to save her life, so whenever I try to sing Tour Lura Lura, which is what she would sing to me occasionally, I always sing it off-key because that's how she sang it. And my father had two lullabies that he would sing to me. Ragtime Cowboy Joe, and if you're a very good audience and you remind me at the end of my talk, I will tell you what the second lullaby was. So, it is perhaps because of my exposure to Ragtime Cowboy Joe that I've become a card-carrying member of the Charles and Russell fan club. Uh, after learning about his collections last year, I tentatively approached Natalie and Dr. King and said, do you think there might be a place for something on his humor? Um, what I like about the Russell world is the generosity of spirit that marks its scholars and students. Byron Price, Dwayne King, uh, Natalie Panther, Diana Folsom have all been so generous with their time, and seldom has it been my privilege to dip, out, dip in and out of such rigorous, heartfelt, and spirited research exemplified in the works of Brian Dippy, Larry Lynn Peterson, John Taliaferro, and Raphael James Christie. Thus, through my own family history and my current research into Gilded Age philanthropic families, um, I've become interested in American humor, which eventually ends somewhere at Mark Twain. Um, what you're looking at on the left is a family picture of a gentleman named Randall Wade. He's the dapper fellow in the top hat there. His son, uh, Homer Wade, who's on the right, will become one of the founders of the Cleveland Museum of Art. Uh, little Homer's grandfather was Jeff the Homer Wade I, who was one of the founders of Western Union. And though he was not present at that uh, recreate, he was not present at the scene where the two railroads met, he did have a telegram from Brigham Young that day because he was essential in the creating of the two lines. Um, so I look at the, uh, what I'm doing with my research into Gilded Age philanthropy is looking at something uh, called the creation of the urban cultural infrastructure. What does it take for cities in the Midwest and West to get culture? What's required of the people who give money? How do they give money? And generally what we find in the Gilded Age is that philanthropists gave money 
broadly and deeply to a wide variety of things, uh, health, education, welfare, and culture, in order to build up cities. Um, so the reason I have these, sorry, the reason I have these two pictures up here is in 1870 and 71, Randall Wade went to Europe for 15 months. He arrived the week the Franco-Prussian War started, but as he says in one of his journal entries, um, uh, uh, we don't mind about that. We're Americans, and Americans are safe everywhere. And in fact, they go out and they buy uh, the makings for an American flag, and they hang it outside of their hotel room in Germany, so everybody knows they're Americans. But when you read Randall Wade's 995 pages of his journal, which I transcribed, took three years to transcribe, it starts to sound very much like Mark Twain's Innocence Abroad. And in fact, Mark Twain had just, run it, uh, had just written Innocence Abroad three years previously. He was well known in Cleveland, and the, the things that Mark Twain writes about are, of course, based in reality. So let's talk a little bit about Mark Twain. That's my favorite quote from Mark Twain. Um, Mark Twain writes, I know, isn't that a great quote? <laughs> There's more, there's more to the actual quote, but that's the essential part. Um, you know, uh, we've talked about them. Um, uh, 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 Byron uh, discussed, you know, used the term the legend. You know, Mark Twain is a man, he's a myth, he's a legend. Um, many people start the history of comedy in America with Mark Twain. But in order to understand the appeal of Twain's humor for audiences in the decades following the Civil War, scholars discuss his work in the context of a literary genre referred to as local color literature. Now, I'm assuming a lot of you know about this, but I'm just going to review it. Um, local color literature pretty much encompasses the entire Gilded Age, that's 1865 to about 1895. And not um, uh, coincidentally, as Raphael James Christie noted in his excellent 2004 book, Charles and Russell, The Storyteller's Art, it coincides with Russell's formative years. Local color and genre painting and, um, would have been the contemporary and near contemporary literature and art of Russell's childhood. So before we start talking about either Twain or Russell as a humorist, it's important to understand the origins and influences of the authors whose names and works are associated with this genre. And you're familiar with a lot of them. Harriet Beecher Stowe, um, uh, you know her from Uncle Tom's Cabin, which I find tedious in the extreme, but I love The Pearl of Oars Island, which I think is a wonderful book. Um, Joe Handler Harris, who is the writer of the Uncle Remus books, Hamlin Garland, The Trail of the Gold Seekers, and of course uh, Sarah Orner Jewett, and Mark Twain, and many others. Many of these regional authors wrote fiction. Sometimes it was humorous, often it was not. But an overarching impetus for the authors was to capture a sense of time and place, to capture stories and dialects before they disappear. So it starts sounding, starting to sound familiar while we're talking about that with regard to Russell. In the Oxford Companion to American Literature, the genre is defined as, in local color literature, one finds the dual influence of romanticism and realism. Tick box, Charles Russell. The author looks away from the ordinary life to distant lands. Tick box, Charles Russell. Um, strange customs, tick box. It doesn't say tick box in the Oxford Companion to Literature on tick boxes. Exotic scenes, but retains a minute sense of detail, a sense of fidelity, and a sense of accuracy of description. Romanticism and realism are the characteristics of local color literature. 1865 to 1895 also coincides with the transformation of the United States. In the years following the Civil War, up to and including the Gilded Era, era, Gilded era the United States was changing. The pre-Civil War homogeneity was giving away to the proverbial melting pot, particularly in urban areas, and we were experiencing, many of us were experiencing, I was not alive then, <laughs> Many people were experiencing um, a nostalgia for things of the past or things of the West. So it's important to note here that local color literature was not existing in a vacuum. The people who were writing these books were not just keeping to themselves. The people who were painting paintings were also thinking about these ideas. We just don't call it local color painting. We call it regionalism. 
Um, so it wasn't just a literary movement, uh, but expanded to include painters associated with regionalism. And in this case, the time frame is much more expansive and encompasses the long 19th century. And it includes artists like George Caleb Bingham, John James Audubon, Eastman Johnson, Winslow Homer, George Caitlin, and George Ennis. An extraordinary number of Georges <laughs> for regionalist painters. It's like going to a Greek festival sometimes. <laughs> um, so I just brought a couple of my, it's my car. I got to bring in some of my favorite paintings. So George Discovery Dance, um, Sax and Fox from 1835, and I compared it to Winslow Homer's Snap the Whip from 1872. And then my other for me, um, George Caleb Bingham's Fur Traders Descending the Missouri in 1845, and Eastman Johnson's Cranberry Harvest Island of Nantucket from 1818. This is in the Tempkin Collection at the, um, in San Diego. This is a horrible photograph. It is one of the most beautiful paintings I've ever seen because dotted almost like an impressionist painting with these little red cranberries that you can't see in this. It's so distressing to me. Okay. Anyway, and the point is you can't just nicely compartmentalize literature, art, music, and theater. Tragedy and comedy exist in all of these forms in the 19th century. Again, uh, Raphael James Christie makes a compelling argument for assigning Russell a seat in the pantheon of local color authors based on his writings. But I'd like to take the canonization one step further and state that we can arguably assign Charles M. Russell the crown as the quintessential humorist of the American West because in his life he was able to incorporate the pre-established American comedic archetypes and communicate them to audiences across an extraordinarily wide variety of media. And I just brought two quotes up there. So, um, you know, again, if we are going to accord, uh, I don't really want to accord uh, Twain first place. Twain's literary. And when you look at how he talks about humor, he talks about it in a literary fashion. This is my favorite of many favorite quotes from Charles Russell. Life has never been too serious with me. I live to play and I'm playing yet. Laughs and good judgment have saved me from many a black eye, but I don't laugh at other people's tears. So, my question back there. What does it mean to be an American humorist? Is Russell a humorist? And if he is, what makes him a humorist? Being a humorist is more than being able to tell a joke. One way to approach this is to look at what makes Twain a humorist. And so there's a wonderful book by Judith Yaris Lee that came out in 2012 called Twain's Brand. And in Twain's Brand, she identifies four elements that characterize Twain's success as, um, as a writer and particularly a humorist in America. The notion of the performed self, uh, which is a, she defines as a modern idea encompassing the notion of self existing or born through social interaction. Comic cross cultural contrast, this is the them and us. Vernacular vision, uh, which is naive irony. And brand name marketing. Fair enough? So, um, Russell, you can apply all the same things to Russell. Here's Russell's brand the notion of the performed self that begins probably even before he goes to Montana, but lasts throughout his entire career. His current, uh, his brand of comic cross-cultural contrast, I'm going to talk more about this in a little while. His vernacular vision in his stories and in his paintings. I'm only going to show this one on the left once. This is Hooverizing. I love Hooverizing. And brand name marketing. And so brand name marketing, you have to include a Nancy when you include brand name marketing for Russell's. But all of the qualities that um, uh, Lee uses to describe Twain's success, you can use to describe Russell's success as well. And originally my idea for this paper was to take a much closer look at the works of Twain, Bret Hart, and Russell using this theory. Mind you, given how prolific Charles Russell was as an artist, I really feel that you can cherry pick any topic you want to on any subject and write a paper about that. Um, <laughs> but I have a theory I want to make. And then when I was just looking at how to write this, a colleague of mine introduced me to someone I'd like to introduce you to. Her name is Constance Rourke. Anybody know Constance Rourke? Oh, that's so wonderful because you're going to know her now. This is a quote for her. Um, let me tell you a little about her. She was born in Cleveland, an only child. Her father died of tuberculosis in Colorado before she was three years old. 
She was raised by a strict mother who was a progressive educator. She went off to Vassar. She traveled in Europe. She attended the Sorbonne. She taught at Vassar and eventually left to write social criticism. She wrote books on Davy Crockett, John James Audubon, Harriet Beecher Stowe, Horace Greeley, the actress Lotta Crabtree, and a host of others. Um, and in 1931, she wrote a critically important book called Three Essential, uh, called American Humor, A Study of National Character. This book is important because up until the period when she wrote it, a lot of people who were writing about American culture said, there ain't any. You know, that any kind of culture we have is culture that has been brought up from Europe. And she took a look at it and she said, no, America does have a culture and it's inextricably entwined with our humor. And she traces the development of three key archetypes throughout the 19th century. Although, um, and here are the three key, key archetypes. The one on the top is the Yankee peddler. The one in the middle, middle is the frontiersman. And the one on, uh, the last one is um, the Negro minstrel and minstrel shows. Um, these are the three uh, categories that I think are essential to our understanding of both Twain and Russell. In the 20th century, 21st century, we are far away from these three archetypes. And although Twain and Russell belong to different generations, there was 30 years between them, they both would have been familiar with these archetypes. So let's talk a little bit about the, uh, I brought these two pictures in. This is Twain at 15 and Russell at 15, right? Um, Twain is up in Hannibal, Missouri. And uh, 30 years later, Charles M. Russell is in St. Louis, Missouri. So let's talk a little bit about these three. Um, uh, on the left-hand side here is a, pack, uh, is a drawing of a man whose name was Yankee Hill. And Yankee Hill in the 20s and the 30s of the 19th century would go around the country performing Yankee speeches, Yankee monologues. Monologue. So the idea of the Yankee peddler at the beginning is the Yankee peddler is that guy from Connecticut or someone on the eastern seaboard who comes and without you even knowing about it, cheats you out of something or sells you something you don't need or tells a little story and at the end you find you're kind of the butt of the joke. Um, so, so he's going around the country doing this. This was something that was established. It was something that was acknowledged. I brought two of my favorite contemporary Yankee peddler stories. Okay, not so contemporary. The Music Man, right? He comes in and sells people uh, musical instruments they don't need. And my very favorite Maverick episode ever, I have a favorite Ma Maverick episode, is Shady Deal at Sunny Acres, where Maverick is done bad to and he needs to get his money back and he needs to resolve things and all he does is sit on the porch and whittle the entire show while things happen around him. It's the quintessential, I'm gonna use that word a lot, um, Yankee peddler story. I wanna point out something else. Yankee peddlers whittle. <laughs> That's what they're known for. They have something in their hands and they tell you stories and they don't look at you, they're just, um, as Byron said, they're just creating magic. And so you can see I've given you this, this same photograph that Byron shows. And now I want to digress just briefly and talk about something I call pocket magic and doggerel. So um, this is a little pig. Don't know exactly how it survived that, um, Char uh, that Charlie Russell made. Um, and I've got this theory, and I don't know how exactly I'm going to prove it, that people who are humorists have pocket magic. And it may be a deck of cards, or it may be the ability to mold figures in wax. My father was a geologist. He always kept a jeweler's loop in his pocket and would find something interesting and would pull the jeweler's loop out and make us look at it. Um, Homer uh, uh, Wade, who I work on, who founded the Clay Museum of Art, was a collector of gems and jewels, and he kept in his pocket a tiny little box filled with tiny little pearls of every color to show to people and sort of amaze them with the beauty in the world and tell them stories. So, so pocket magic, and pocket magic is something that Charles Russell had. Um, and there's also doggerel. Another thing that's happening in the 19th century is a lot of people are writing what you would call doggerel. People, um, you know, are, are literary and they write little poems, they put them on, uh, they attach them to the presents, they send them in notes. Um, this is Lead Elk, Elk and Forest that's in the Gilcrease collection, it's on porcelain. I brought that in because, um, you know, it's very like the camera's eye. And this is a little painting, uh, this is a little poem that J.H. Wade 
on a Christmas gift, he gave both of his son Kodak cameras, and he wrote this little poem to go uh, along with the Christmas gift. So, um, and like, you know, there's always so pocket magic and humor and doggerel is, is all mixed up in this for me. I told you it was a work in progress, right? End of the depression. Thank you for your patience while I turn page. Another aspect of the um, Yankee peddler and how it sort of transforms over the 19th century is the Yankee peddler then becomes sort of the voice, he becomes the voice of America. He comes out of nowhere and then he becomes the voice of America. And that's when we start getting these um, literary figures who are performing themselves. Seba Smith was the creator of Jack Downing, who was a political co who, who you know, talked in, talked in camp and was man of the people and told things like it was. Um, Charles Farrar Brown, who was the creator of Artemis Ward, he was, uh, uh, wrote from one of the Cleveland pa papers. Um, if you uh, know about Artemis Ward, generally people only know one story about Artemis Ward. It's that just before um, Lincoln read the uh, Emancipation Proclamation to his cabinet for the first time, he read a segment of Artemis Ward's comedy to them. And um, his, his cabinet members would frequently find him reading Artemis Ward, and they were disturbed at that because serious things were going on, and, and he basically explained that, you know, we have a choice to laugh or cry at sometimes, and that we need to laugh. Um, and then Samuel Clemens, the creator of Mark Twain. So what I'd like to point out with these three voices of the people is none of them felt like being themselves, or it was not appropriate them. They all created these pseudonyms that are outside themselves, which is not what Charles Russell does. Charles Russell is Charles Russell. Um, our American Cousin, this was the play that Lincoln was actually seeing when he was assassinated. Uh, this is another aspect of the Yankee, um, what the Yankee peddler becomes. The Yankee eventually, eventually becomes who America, who other countries think Americans are. We're rough, we're rude, we're not polished, we're not finished. To the English person, he was, the American was uh, sharp, rural, uncouth, witty. The English, on the other hand, by Americans, were considered refined, feminine, and silly. So this is the comic cross-cultural contrast that Lee references, and though she's referencing particularly Twain's works like Innocence Abroad and A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, the contrast was there from the time the Yankee was acknowledged not just as a regional figure, but as a national figure. And this is the notion of the Yankee that Charles Russell grows up with. This person who is in um, contrast to the refined people of the East and to the refined people in Europe. And these are the two main characters from um, our American cousin, uh, Asa Trenchard and Lord Dundreary. And of course, what would any humorous talk be without reference to a French philosopher? Right? Um, so this is young Charlie, and this is the French philosopher Henri Louise Bergson. By the end of the century, by 1880, when young Charlie Russell heads off to Montana to pursue a lifelong ambition, and remember, his life hadn't been very long at that point, um, to become a cowboy, he chooses to remake himself. In order to successfully attain his goal, he needed to shed as quickly as possible any Eastern qualities that marked him as a tenderfoot. Consciously and or unconsciously, a product of both his nature and nurture, he embraces the mythic qualities of the Yankee peddler and places them in his cowboy arsenal. Thin, practical, an individual who has to exercise his wits on a daily basis. Slow to speak with a roundabout way of story. Someone from whose hands unexpected and fanciful shapes would emerge. And a figure of irreverent wisdom and persistent humor. The French philosopher Henry Bergson noted in 1900, in three very famous essays on laughter, that the comic comes into being just when society and the individual, freed from the worry of self-preservation, begin to regard themselves as a work of art. And I would argue that at the point he hits Montana, even though he's having, he's got artwork work to do, he is considering himself a work of art. He is transforming himself into this uh, person that he wants to be. There is no doubt in my mind that the adolescent Charles Russell was himself a work of art in progress, and another important role model, in the truest term, a model for the role um, he has to play is the character Rourke identifies as 
Um, oh, sorry, I get a little ahead of myself. Um, these are two uh, comic uh, cross-cultural contrasts. Um, this is not by Russell, this is by Wallace D. Co Coburn. It's Russell in London Town. I don't know if you can read it, but the Englishmen are laughing at him going, ha, ha, ho. And he says, have a good time, boys. You're just as funny to me. <laughs> and that's a classic Yankee peddler. And then this one, um, friends, friend, friends sent a message to Sid A. Willis. It's me and Jack, and I think I brought the text of that. Um, uh, uh, maybe I didn't bring the text of it, but basically he's talking about he can't come home from New York right now because uh, Rockefeller needs him. And that every time, every time he wants to come home, Rockefeller invites him up for milk and crackers. <laughs> you can see how that would impact. Uh, so, the second um, category that uh, Lee comes up with is the frontiersman. We know from Charlie Russell himself that he was fascinated as a youth with tales of the great frontiersmen living off the land. Daniel Boone, Davy Crockett, Kit Carson had achieved legendary status by the time Russell was, was in his teens. And he spoke often of his love of Ned Buntline's um, comic novels. Oh my gosh, somebody should do a symposium on Ned Butlin, because that guy was crazy. He has got a crazy story. Um, but Charlie also had lived experience. Uh, his great-grandfather on his father's side, Silas Bent, had been the father of 11 children. Um, a daughter, Lucy Bent, would become his grandmother. Two of Lucy's brothers, Charles and William, went west, married unconventional brides, although my paper says broads. Married unconventional broads, Charles, a Mexican woman, and William, a Cheyenne. Two of William's own children, George and Charles, both served in the Confederate forces before leaving to join a Cheyenne Warriors Society. Dime novels, in this case, served to reinforce Russell's lived family history with its own emphasis on larger-than-life characters having larger-than-life adventures separated from civilization. In the St. Louis of his youth, Russell could see further evidences of these type of characters in the art and artists he would have experienced. Carl Weimer is an acknowledged influence, and George Caleb Bingham, St. Louis's own native son, had to have been as well. Bingham, already a noted portraitist, made a further name for himself as a chronicler of river life. The paint, this painting on the right, originally titled French Trader, Half-Breed Son, now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, was deemed too controversial when it was displayed in New York City at the American Art Union. But Bingham, like Russell himself almost a half century later, in chronicling the river frontiersman, was capturing in paint a time that was soon to be lost. And in her book, um, uh, uh, Rourke says, puts the river men, puts the river men into the category of frontiersmen. And of course, the major, um, uh, sort of our major image of um, rivermen are these paintings that were painted by George Caleb Bingham, like the jolly flatboat men, um, just as the period when steam power was coming in and their jobs were being taken away. I would say that you have to understand, to understand Charles Russell, Russell that the jolly flatboat man was a thing. It was everywhere. Um, in 1847, the American Art Union published it in an edition of 10,000 engravings, and a further edition of 8,000 was struck from the same plate in 1860. The printing techniques that allowed the widespread dissemination of Bingham's work were steadily improved upon throughout the long 19th century, and so Russell uh, himself would eventually benefit from advances in printing that made the Illustrated Magazine and artists like Frederick Remen Remington and himself household names can't not bring Audubon. Audubon has to be in here as a frontiers man too. Another great story, which I won't go into, Audubon was, you know, a, a, a wonderful figure, um, a larger than life figure. This is a painting, um, John Simon, who was a Scottish artist, and um, I brought the wild turkey. I think that, I think that Audubon ought to always be juxtaposed next to wild turkey, personally. Um, there's a wonderful story about another naturalist, French naturalist, who came to visit him, to whom he told lies. He invented animals. And you know, again, 21st century, we have a tendency to think, oh, we were John James Audubon, everything you say is true. And he wasn't above 19th century pranksterism, because in the 19th century, in Jacksonian America, Fool me once, shame on me. Shame on, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. 
So um, Audubon was a prankster, and one of the things that characterize frontiersmen is they're pranksters, and they are larger than life. So here's John James Audubon in his lovely sash, and Charles Russell in his uh, lovely sash. So from the outset, he begins to be larger than life, like the frontiersmen. Um, frontiersmen are marked by tall talk. And I found this wonderful Davy Crockett, Davy Crockett who's writing two alligators, and this wonderful September 4th, 1908 um, letter that he writes um, to a friend and actually includes a, the friend's daughter was very interested in sort of romance novels. And so he creates this story um, where um, the Dom, you know, the, the romantic Dom was sitting on the porch and he gets eaten by the alligator and Charlie Russell has to get up and he notices that the alligator is full of human. <laughs> so he shoots the alligator and the alligator dies. But, um, and, but the, the man's hat is lost. So larger than life. Uh, frontiersmen are marked by um, daring deeds in the wilderness. Yeah, that's one of the things that characterizes their humor. Uh, this is a detail of the letter on the left. Sorry, the, uh, the, um, uh, the colors don't match. Russell took a day trip to Sperry Glacier, and he wrote to his friend, I have just returned from the glacier, Bill. They say the trail has been improved a lot since you were up there. That may be, but it will need some more fixed up before the goats are troubled with, uh, troubled with autos. It is a good trail for the airships. They have a rope the last time, they have a rope for the last climb, and now when I got hold of it, it was one and all right, and Kid Curry and no other holdup could take it with all the guns in the state. This is the nearest to heaven I ever was, and if the trail is the same all the way, I'll never make it. <laughs> um, so, you know, daring deeds, was daring deeds, his glacier climb. And, you know, you have to ask yourself, too, What's wilderness to a cowboy? So frontiersmen sort of lived in the wilderness and came back. So one of the things that's this wild to, um, to Charles Russell, or at least he pretends it's wild, is coming back to the city and experiencing this. So um, on the left, dear Percy, I'm still on dear old Broadway among the cliff dwellers. Everybody lives high here, but they ain't got me skin much. I'm camped above the timber line myself. And um, on the right-hand side, this wonderful view of, view of the smoke in the city. And he writes, friend Bill, I am still here in the smoke of all the tall teepees. So again, he's sort of creating, you know, even when he's in civilization, he's continuing um, with this uh, presentation of himself as the frontiersman, as the, as the cowboy, as the, the um, incarnation of the American um, naive, wise person. I want to turn now to the last of um, Rourke's categories, and uh, it's difficult because um, uh, it, it's difficult because in the 19th century you cannot discuss the 19th century and humor and comedy without discussing um, menstrual shows. But what I want to point out is what we've learned about actors and menstrual shows is it's a way for people to step away and look back and say things about us to recognize things about the way people behave and make commentary on them. So I brought in this wonderful um, detail from a painting that's at the Clean Museum of Art, um, William Sidney Mount's The Power of Music, which has the, um, uh, the, the black man standing outside the door listening to music being made. And I'm not gonna talk about people, I'm gonna talk about bunnies and bears and elks now. Um, but mostly about bears. So Byron referenced the fact that the animals, right, that animals are important and you can, um, one of the things that happens in folk culture is you use animals to tell stories. You have the animals talk or you tell the stories about animals. Uh, this is the first Charles Russell painting that I ever encountered and I laughed out loud because I love it, you know, and, and here um, you don't necessarily exactly get the humor from the painting. What makes it humorous is how he's titled it, right? Bruin, not bunny, turn the leaders. Sometimes it's just called Bruin, not bunny. I would encourage you to go home and Google this painting because the first four pages are all people who want to sell you reproductions of this. This must be one of the most popular um, Russell paintings that's, that's sold to people. Um, so, right, I don't need to clarify for you what's happening. There's a stage com stagecoach coming down. People looking out at the stagecoach have seen this little bunny rabbit hop by, you know, and they must be thinking, you know, why are you afraid of a little bunny? What's it going to do? Bite you on the bum? Um, sorry, that's from 
Monty Python. <laughs> but what's really happening, and this is what, um, what some people call his predicament paintings, is there's a mother bear protecting her cubs. And we don't know what the outcome is going to be, but in a sense, um, you can call this a predicament painting, or you can call this a tall tale frozen. You know, that you're right in the middle of a tall tale. Another bear, sunshine and shadow, this one is here too. Um, you know, uh, Byron talking about the shadows. This is my favorite of the shadow paintings, um, and I don't know if you can read it. The guy over the right who's looking at the horses, I wonder what's the matter with them fool horses. And this guy, the bear shadow is right over him, says, I ain't wondering. <laughs> From looking at them horses is wise. <laughs> Right, so you get uh, you, they, they've sat in the shade, and now they're going to be in trouble. So again, um, uh, uh, how we act, what we do, uh, you know, instead of instead of when the horses run, when the horses run, what should you do? You should run. So learn something from the horses. Um, friend Bill to William H. Grant, August 12, 1912. I'm sorry, I just love bears. Um, <laughs> so he gets uh, he gets uh, a gift. Bill Rance, who ran the Silver Dollar Saloon, sends him some, uh, I believe it was grape juice. And he writes back and pretends it's alcohol because he's not drinking at this point. point. And he refined the Yankee peddler in evidence. Um, uh, he writes as part of the letter. So that's, that's Russell, and he's selling grape juice to um, thirsty fishermen. And he says, catch one of these long thirst, late weary fishermen with nothing but water to drink and they'd buy red ink at your price and thank you for it. And you know, I like the fact that the bears, the bears um, uh, proving an onlooker at this point, and I don't know, maybe he's waiting for them to finish the grape juice so he can have a little snack. And on the second page of this letter is this wonderful, wonderful um, dance. Um, so, so, so this is Russell himself as the Yankee peddler pulling off a coop, selling red ink or grape juice to fishermen as wine. This is the frontiersman. Well, Bill, there ain't much down up here, but I heard there was a man up on the main range that mixed up with a lady grizzly, and they pulled off a genuine grizzly bear dance. They say the man wasn't strong on the round dance, but he couldn't refuse a lady. The folks that arrived after the ball didn't find much. A belt buckle, some buttons, Things a bear couldn't use. <laughs> and so, while this is pure Russell, um, and one of the things I really love with in, 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 uh, Byron's talk is the, the opening shots with the hand gesture, while this is pure Russell, it's also pure art as well, because um, human beings have a long history of being afraid that animals are going to turn on them. And there's an entire series of medieval um, marginalia and manuscripts where the bunnies, the bunnies, um, uh, stick here was the word for it, bunnies were considered a sign of cowardice and where the bunnies turn on the human beings. And um, I just love that picture. And then my own favorite is um, Non Sequitur by Wiley Miller. I just love it when the bears, yeah, so, okay, I'll admit they're kind of cute, but I still say their herds need to be thinned. <laughs> In general, in general, um, Wiley Miller is not my favorite comic strip person who draws comic strips, um, but I love his bears. I love the sense of humor that his bears have as they uh, approach eating the human race. Um, I talk really fast. <laughs> so, um, one of the uh, arguments that there were, you know, people who study humor have arguments with one another, which I just find is an odd thing to do. Um, American fights, American scholars fight about American humor. And there's this um, line drawn in the stand, and people stand on either side of it, and some people say, American humor is born out of our buoyancy. And the others, people stay and said, no, it's born out of our tragedy and our melancholy. Um, and I don't really know why we have to draw the line because I don't think that's um, I don't think that's a, a necessary or a useful line to draw in the sand. And um, Charles M. Russell seems to have been able to incorporate both those uh, attitudes in his work. So I've put that quote up again. Um, and uh, just a couple more slides. My favorite bears. Um, this is a letter to friend Kilroy, who had apparently been invited uh, to go bear hunting. 
and um, wasn't able to go, so it, it, he reckons that it's going to turn out badly for the people who do get to go bear hunting. Uh, and I don't know, that's, there's that um, cowpuncher that smoked my folks up in the Badlands, and right here is where I play back. And Bear's going to shoot one of the guys up there, and the guy up there says, I'm glad Russell ain't here, we'd be some crowded, we'd be uh, sure some crowded. And this is the sad, I'm, I'm at the point in my life where things make me sad. Um, and the little bear says, shoot him in the kidneys, Mom, let's hear him ball. And that really makes me sad because I think Russell must have heard someone say that in shooting a bear. And so I, you know, I'm just, so maybe I fall on the melancholy today. So despite the 4,000 plus works, we know really little about what Charles Russell wants us to know. Our, we, we know what he wants us to know. We don't know. And so uh, sort of the, one of the last things I want to talk about is the Elks Club. And I want to talk about the Elk Club, because I don't know, do we have any Elks? Any Elks in the audience? Not an Elk in the audience. These two works address Charlie's relationship with the Benevolent Protective Order of Elks in Great Falls, Montana, where he was named an honorary life member in 1913. Um, the one on the left is, uh, I'm sorry, I put the BPOE thing where it says, I rode the goat. So one of the things was, in order to become an Elk, you apparently had to ride a goat and be successful. So he says, I rode the goat. And on the right is a painting inscribed to my brothers. It's called The Exalted Ruler, which is what one calls the Ed Elk and the Elks Club. Um, and it was a gift that he gave to the Elks Club in Great Falls, Montana in 1913 when he was made an honorary member. My father was an elk. His father was an elk because um, uh, his father, the Vaudevillian, was an elk because the original purpose of the Elks Club was to provide a place for New York City menstrual show performers, the Jolly Corks, with a social club, a place to drink after hours when their shows were finished. It actually started in 1868 as a social club, um, and there was a social service role in it. When a member died, they passed the hat to provide for any family that was left over. When the time came to choose a mascot, they considered both the elk and the buffalo, and they were looking for a readily identifiable creature of stature indigenous to America. Whatever the Elks Club has become, it was originally a place where people who enjoyed being the center of attention could meet and drink and laugh with one another. Because I believe that America humor is, American humor is, at its core, a social experience, a coming together to tell our stories, stories of what we once had and stories of who we are, it's about being able to laugh at ourselves and with others. It is a sharing of experiences and concerns about change. It is a comforting reassurance that we are in this together. And because I have yet to run across an individual whose life embraces these ideas more joyfully and thoroughly than Charles M. Russell, he is, for me, the quintessential American humorist. And I'm going to leave you with two things. This painting by him of Laugh Kills Lonesome, which says everything to me. And I promised you a second lullaby. My father's second lullaby was Egyptian Ella. Um, and because it's not over till the fat lady sings. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ella, you can see one? No, Ella was a dancing girl who started getting fat. And every day brought two more pounds to Ella. Till one day she found she lost her job because of that. And then to make it worse, she lost her fella. So she took a trip to Egypt to forget, and they tell me that she's dancing there till yet. If you hear of a gal who can shake and quake till it makes you feel like an earnest state, I'm talking about Egyptian Ella. And when she goes to do her dance by the River Nile, it makes all the fellas take their old sweethearts and throw them to the crocodile. She's a great big gal in the great big land, and the fellas all give her a great big hand. I'm talking about Egyptian Ella. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.